fact, dead. Uh, uh, well, not dead, perhaps, but rather undead. And the mayor has issued a state of emergency. He wants to assure us that the situation is under control. We'll be right back after these messages. In today's breakdown, we're delving deep into the blood-soaked world of the 1989 low-budget horror gem, The Dead Next Door. Prepare to be immersed in a nostalgia-infused blend of practical effect work, zombie mayhem, and chaotic storytelling as this undead world explores a group of mercenary zombie killers in a post-apocalyptic America. As a film that pays incredible homage to classic zombie movies, The Dead Next Door has clawed its way from obscurity to earn its spot among these same classics. This is a movie that focuses on fun scenes and pure chaos, so as the story bounces from moment to moment, be sure to aim for the head and enjoy the ride. If you think you'd survive this apocalyptic nightmare, then be sure to subscribe and join our ever-growing zombie squad. This movie doesn't mess around with much of an introduction. We see a man named Dr. Bo being chased by some thugs. As the men are trying to get the doctor, Bo begins to beg God for forgiveness for what he's done. Just before the thugs break the door down, they're grabbed by a zombie and eaten. We then see an undead outbreak across the globe, throwing us rapidly into a world scourged by a zombie apocalypse. Channel 5 has now learned that this grotesque happening is, in fact, a reality. And one that is quickly spreading as more and more of these human cannibals appear throughout this area. We cut to a few years later and meet the Zombie Squad, a group of zombie-killing experts and mercenaries assigned by the remaining government to try and rescue living citizens. The Zombie Squad are the main characters of the film, so to name them off, we have Raimi, Klein, Richards, Mercer, and Color. This movie was funded by Sam Raimi after his success in Evil Dead 2, so throughout the film, there are a lot of callbacks and easter eggs to some of his work, or works that inspired him. Also, a fun trend they do in this film is name characters after movie directors, so keep a listen out for those callbacks as well. The practical effect work in this film is really fun, and the zombies are the fun kind of zombies. The ones that stumble around and have partial memory of the time when they were alive, giving us a lot of fun and silly scenes of the undead acting as if they were still living. The zombies are also practically immortal. A bullet through the brain doesn't usually stop them, and even full decapitation doesn't seem to keep them down. Look at it! Why won't they die? The thing's heads off its body, for Christ's sakes! Doesn't it know that? <laughs> the squad clears out a house, but as Richards is reaching for his dropped weapon, his fingers are bitten off and the whole group knows that this means he's infected. A horde of undead are beginning to approach the house, so Richards tells the others to leave him. I'd rather be a zombie meal than become one of those. Needing to check back in with HQ and get a replacement for Richards, the zombie squad heads back to Washington, D.C. In the rec room, other squad members are watching the evil dead while protesters shout outside because they think zombies are still humans that need protection. Klein and Color split off to rest and Raimi and Mercer head to Dr. Molson to report and hear their next assignment. Dr. Molson has an assistant named Dr. Franklin and another named Dr. Savini, so there's another few directors to add to the list. Dr. Molson is a fun character. He's fairly unhinged and has this rad hat saying that he was wrong once, but it turns out he was mistaken. He's developed a device that integrates into a zombie's throat to give them the ability to talk. When I was a young boy. Me, me, I'm hungry. And while you think this might be a pretty important thing in this movie, it's never used again after this scene. So, I mean, it's pretty cool still. Molson has a working theory that should be able to eradicate the zombie virus entirely, but it will require Dr. Bo's original serum to work, so he assigns Raimi and his zombie squad to retrieve that serum. Unfortunately, just before they leave, Mercer's hand gets bitten by a zombie. Dr. Molson is able to tourniquet his arm so that the virus can't spread quickly, but he will still likely become a zombie within the next few days, so the window to retrieve the cure has just closed significantly. They head out the next day, bringing Molson and Franklin along since this task is so sensitive. They go to Bo's house to look for the serum, where they find a survivor named Vincent, who rambles on about a local church. Raimi and Culler go to clear the basement. Creepy place. Just right for some zombies. Yeah. 
They find the remains of Dr. Bo, but it's odd because it's clear that he wasn't killed by zombies. The next morning, we see a man named Commander Carpenter is watching the zombie squad, and he seems to be looking for Vincent, but we'll get back to him a little bit later. Dr. Molson and Dr. Franklin are scouring through Bo's notes, and they find the formula for the original serum. When they say that soon they'll be able to get rid of the zombies, Vincent freaks out and slices Klein with a machete and kills him. He gets shot by Raimi, but he is able to make it to a car driven by Carpenter. Raimi and Mercer get into their car and pursue them to the church that Vincent has been preaching about. This facility is run by a man named Reverend Jones, and they have a belief that zombies are God's will and they keep them alive and fed. We learn that Dr. Bo's daughter, Anna, is a member of this church, and she and Vincent are lovers. Vincent tells them about the soldiers and their task before he passes away. While Raimi is scouting out the church, he realizes how far gone these people are. He sees them conducting human sacrifices and sees that the basement is completely full of the undead. It's a damn cult. Also, while speaking with the Reverend, Anna reveals that her memory is gone, but Raimi recognizes her from pictures that he saw in Bo's house. Raimi and Mercer head back to meet with the others. Molson and Franklin have finished the serum, and Molson decides to test it on Mercer right away. Doctor, what if you, we made a mistake with the serum? What would happen to Mercer? Nothing will happen to Mercer, Dr. Franklin. I will stake my hat and my life on it. <laughs> Raimi and Culler go back to the church and steal a zombie for Molson to test on, but this zombie was apparently special to Reverend Jones, so the whole cult arms up to go and get it back. They release leashed zombies to surround the squad, and Raimi responds by throwing grenades all around him. Uh, no flashbacks! No flashbacks! I, uh, huh? Raimi and the others make a break for their car, but are forced to leave Mercer behind because he's unconscious. They know that the cult will take him back to the church, so they decide to go there at dawn once things have calmed down. Reverend Jones sees the zombie squad on his cameras and sets up a maze through the facility to lead them directly to a place that he calls the Altar Room. He goes to begin a sermon to all of his followers. He preaches about the evils of Dr. Bo, and he also has Mercer who has completely become a zombie. Brave. Welcome, murderers. It's about time. Suddenly, the zombie that Molson experimented on begins to smoke and spew orange liquid, and Molson exclaims that his serum has worked. Once Dr. Franklin removes Mercer's mask, Mercer speaks and thanks the man, but Franklin is shot by Jones. Raimi shoots the Reverend, causing the cult members to chase the zombie squad out of the facility. Anna stays behind to help the Reverend, but he admits to Anna that Dr. Bo was her father, and that he was the one who killed him because he thought his experiments were a form of witchcraft. Anna runs away, leaving Reverend Jones to stumble into the basement, where he opens the door, sacrificing himself and unleashing hundreds of undead into the compound. With the zombies causing a chaotic distraction, Raimi decides to head back in to get Mercer. Unfortunately, it seems that Mercer was able to escape on his own, and he's not too happy with Dr. Molson. See what you did to me, Molson? I'm gonna rip you to shreds for this. Ah! Raimi and Carpenter have a super epic two-shot gunfight, and <laughs> Raimi gets the upper hand once Mercer shows up and distracts him. You wanna come with us? No, man. I'm a zombie now. Whatever you do, don't use Molson serum. Don't use it on someone, unless they're really dead. Mercer warns Raimi not to use Molson serum on anyone unless they are officially dead, and then he stumbles off to find and kill Molson. Meanwhile, Anna finds Kohler, but Anna is grabbed by a horde of zombies, so I guess her story is over now. Molson hides in a room with a working phone, and he's able to get a hold of Dr. Savini. He gives the man his serum formula. The zombies then break the door down, forcing Molson to retreat into a cage. Huh, what are you gonna do, rip up my tongue? Yeah. Something like that. The cage is next to a window, so he pulls out a pocket knife and begins to whittle down the cage bars to try and escape. His plan doesn't work at all as his cage falls over, allowing the zombies to tear him from limb to limb, and worst of all, steal his hat. Raimi makes it out of the facility, but he's bitten by a zombie just before he gets back into the car. Yeah. 
He and Culler drive off, and Raimi is given Molson serum, turning him into a human zombie just like Mercer. He gets angry and begins to kill the doctors inside, giving us a scream and a rapid ending to the dead next door. As we wrap up our thrilling exploration of the dead next door, we're left in awe of its remarkable achievements. The film's outstanding practical effects, despite its shoestring budget, have stood the test of time, proving that creativity and passion can triumph over limitations. The chaotic yet engaging storytelling keeps us on the edge of our seats, leaving no room for a dull moment. Furthermore, the numerous nods to classic horror films pay tribute to the genre's rich history, endearing the movie to diehard fans and newcomers alike. Reflecting on the state of zombie horror in our modern cinematic landscape, The Dead Next Door serves as a timeless reminder of the undead's enduring allure and the genre's potential for innovation. Its influence on aspiring filmmakers is undeniable, inspiring them to push the boundaries and create unforgettable tales that terrify and entertain audiences worldwide. If you enjoyed this breakdown, don't forget to like and subscribe, and share it to keep this horror community thriving and vibrant with undead delights. And until next time, happy watching, and stay safe out there. Bye bye That's got to be the best part I've ever seen. So it would seem. <laughs>